Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at VAFB.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce the wonderful local products we enjoy. Brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. People have been warming themselves with wood for millennia. Now it can help power your whole house. Ginger is the magic ingredient in this scone recipe. And hot pepper season is coming fast in Virginia. Home will always be Virginia. Between the Blue Ridge and Chesapeake Bay. Atlantic to Appalachia. Welcome back to Real Virginia, everyone. We're coming to you this week from Chesterfield State Forest. Foresters in Halifax County are doing their part to keep the lights on in Virginia and beyond. Burke Muller shows us how wood debris can be turned into electricity. The Halifax County Biomass Electric Generating Facility in South Boston helps agriculture at both ends of the production process. It provides a beneficial use for wood scraps that once would have been discarded or burned as refuse. And once the wood has been used to produce electricity, the remaining ash is used by farmers to help their cropland thrive. More on that later. First, the wood debris has to be hauled in on semi-trucks that can hold 25 tons of wood refuse. About 90 truckloads a day come to this facility and the scraps are used to generate enough energy to provide electricity for 16,000 homes. Mike Davis manages the facility and took us on a tour. The wood is introduced into the power plant itself and the, the dozers will pile the wood up on a floor that brings it out to the conveyor belt. We're moving about 65 tons an hour to go through the system. We also remove any ferrous metal that may come in in the facility through the loads. Uh, a lot of times it's spare truck parts and, and fence posts and things of that nature. Uh, but we pull all that out to protect the equipment downstream. While the facility only accepts raw wood debris, Davis says he's seen an entire car bumper with a license plate and all sorts of oddities that come out of the truck. So as the wood travels up the system, it goes into a, a sizing screen. This tower takes the material and anything that's oversized gets reprocessed and put back out into the pile to be reintroduced later. Once the material is properly sized, it goes up a long conveyor belt to almost the top of the boiler structure. At that point, it enters a fuel bin where approximately 30 minutes worth of fuel is stored. Once the material is up there, it's, just, it's literally like a fuel injector on your car, but it's wood. It's blowing wood chips into a big furnace and then air is introduced through other ports. It's that combination that gives us our combustion. It's important to note that the wood chips themselves don't create the electricity. Burning them produces steam, which provides the thrust to turn a turbine. The turbine blades are attached to a rotor, and a generator converts the kinetic energy of the moving rotor into electrical energy through a process known as electromagnetic induction. It requires a lot of heat, and careful monitoring to make sure the facility stays within environmental regulations. On this screen over here, primarily in light blue, we actually monitor all our emissions every minute, every hour, every 24 hours, and even a 30-day average. We run under the, one of the tightest emissions permitting requirements in the country and we are easily maintaining uh, acceptable and below permit limit levels. Davis says once the electricity is generated, the megawatts are ready to be introduced to the electrical system, providing the grid with locally sourced clean energy. The cooling towers condense the steam once it is passed through the turbine. From the side of the road, this may look like pollution, but it's actually water vapor. And this facility behind me can process 800,000 gallons of water each day. That water is reclaimed from a nearby wastewater treatment facility. Since agriculture is bringing the raw materials to make the electricity, it only makes sense that agriculture benefits from the byproduct of the wood conversion process. Ash is removed from the facility's furnace. 
Crop and grain farmers use the ash to raise the pH of their soil. Jonathan Hudson started using ash from the plant soon after it opened in late 2013. He saw the benefits and told his fellow farmers about its useful properties. Initially, there was skepticism. But they've seen the results just like I have. And um, you, can, you can turn bad land around quick. Land that maybe somebody's been neglecting, haven't paid attention to pH, haven't paid attention to the fertilizer analysis. You can really turn it around quick and get it back into productivity. Putting usable wood scraps to good use for electricity to power our everyday life and to bring out the best qualities in the land. Yet another way Virginia's forest industry benefits everyone. In Halifax County, I'm Burke Moeller reporting. Forestry is Virginia's third largest economic sector. In 2021, the harvesting of Virginia timber generated $319 million in total timber sales, along with 108,451 jobs and $11.3 billion in value-added income. Hardwood trees are the most common statewide and a large source of exported timber, but there are plenty of pine and other softwood trees harvested for construction supplies and pulp for paper and cardboard products. The growth of Virginia's forest industry slowed during the pandemic, but business started to rebound in 2022. More than $509 million worth of wood products were shipped to buyers in other countries last year. I'm Mark Viet. Coming up on In the Garden, we're going to talk about how to get your wisteria to bloom. Stay with us. We are stronger together, especially at this difficult time. For over 90 years, we've watched our membership grow, and we're honored to be part of such a special community. Thank you to the farmers who provide for us every day. Virginia Farm Bureau is proud to serve our members, their families, and to give back to our local communities. That's the Farm Bureau way. It's finally spring across the Old Dominion. Mark Viet has some tips on rejuvenating your wisteria plants if they aren't blooming. In the garden. A common question that I get is, my wisteria won't bloom. There are some things that you can do to help shock your wisteria into blooming. First of all, make sure you're not overfeeding it with too much nitrogen. But if you look here, this is last year's long, uh, wispy growth. As you get toward the tip, the buds are very small and tiny. And as you get down here toward the base, the buds are larger. What you want to do is force all the energy into these basal buds. So I'm going to come in and prune this right to one or two buds. In fact, you know, I'm going to prune it to one bud. There is one bud right here. So I'm just going to come in and prune it. And by doing that, all the energy that this wisteria has is going to go into this one bud and it's going to help it bloom. Now, you can do this a couple different ways. You can do this during a winter cut it all to one bud. That is one way to uh, help your wisteria bloom. But there is another way that you can get your wisteria to bloom. And this is a little more involved. But sometime in September, you're going to come in and you're going to take this long, let's, let's take another one here. You're going to take this long, wispy growth and you're going to cut it to, to six inches. You do that in September. October, you're going to come in and you're going to prune it again. And then November, you're going to prune it to one bud. And what you're doing is forcing all that energy into one bud. So the following year, this will help shock your plant into bloom. So again, you're going to come in and you're going to trim this growth to maybe one bud and you can see where I've done this in the past I have pruned them to one bud I'm gonna come in here just like this 
and it will help shock your wisteria into blooming. Now remember, once you get your wisteria to bloom, it will bloom year after year. The key is to get it to start blooming. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. For more garden tips, go to inthegardenradio.com. Hi, I'm Tammy Brawley with The Green Kitchen. Coming up on Heart of the Home, Cinco Ginger Scones. We hope you'll stay with us. Our cow, she walks into the barn and she gets milked. Milk's taken from her and put it through a uh, chiller. And that milk's taken from body temperature of a cow, which is about 102 and a half, and dropped to 35 degrees and put straight onto a tractor trailer. And it goes straight to the plant the next day. So most of the milk that's sitting on your store shelves is probably less than 48 hours old. And that's, that's a pretty good testament to how, how efficient we are. Ginger is a root vegetable that grows well in Virginia. Chef Tammy Brawley loves it so much, she found several ways to include it in her latest recipe for scones, in the heart of the home. Hi, I'm Chef Tammy Brawley from The Green Kitchen. Today I'm gonna to show you guys how to make some delicious scones. We're gonna use my favorite ingredient, and that is ginger. Ginger, um, the recipe says triple ginger, but believe it or not, I have about five different gingers in here. So we'll talk about that as we go. But with the basic recipe, you always wanna start with about a cup and a half of quick oats. We're gonna measure that out. They're gonna go into the oven. I want them to toast. So I've got them on my parchment paper. Set this over by the side. I'm gonna spread it out a little bit. My oven is already preheated, so we're gonna move the oats to the oven for about maybe five to six minutes, maybe a little longer. And speaking of ginger, um, it is grown in Virginia. You can pick it up at a lot of the farmer's markets, particularly the baby ginger. It's somewhat pink in nature. Um, it's a little bit more tender as would be any uh, baby vegetable. Um, but I love working with it in any way, shape, or form. So I've got my food processor here. I've got about a cup and a half of regular flour or all-purpose flour. I'm gonna go ahead and start my burner on a boil for my ginger while I'm mixing the batter. So I've got um, a cup and a half of flour here. I'm gonna add a third cup of sugar. I'm gonna add two teaspoons of baking powder. I'm gonna talk to you about the sugar. First thing we talk about is the first in, um, I don't know, incarnation of the ginger. I have candied ginger that I keep in my cabinet. You can see how much I have in my quart jar here, or quart container. I keep it there, I grind it in the food processor, and then I get a nice ginger sugar. So while the recipe says a third cup sugar, I'm using a third cup ginger sugar. So we're gonna add that to our flour with the two teaspoons of baking powder. We want about a half a teaspoon of salt. And I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna add my second ginger and that is ginger powder. It is concentrated, you do want about a teaspoon. I'm gonna go ahead and get the food processor on and get that going. Uh, at this point, all I'm doing is blending. So I can let that sit for a moment. Our water is starting to come to a boil. Now, when you work with fresh ginger, it has a peel on it. And in some um, incarnations, you can just leave the peel on. Um, whenever I grate it for recipes, I will leave the peel on. But for this recipe for candy, and I did go ahead and peel a big chunk of it here. So I'm going to move my peel out of the way. What I want to do is actually want to come back and you want to get this really as thin as you possibly can. And I love using this. We're going to let it boil or simmer for about 10 minutes while we finish our batter for the scones. Um, so to that, we're actually going to come back for the batter. We're going to add some cold butter while the processor is going on. I've cut it into uh, diced pieces. You just wouldn't want to add the whole half a cup in there, eight to 10 tablespoons. It's going to blend quite nicely. This is ready. I'm going to now move this to a larger bowl. If you actually put your finger underneath, you can hold that food processor blade in place and dump your food processor out and lo and behold, that blade stays. 
So in this we have the flour and the sugar and the butter and a little salt and baking powder. We are going to now add some chopped candied ginger. Now this is ginger I did purchase from the grocery store. You can get it where they sell bulk nuts and things like that or you can come back and add the candied ginger that we're going to make. So in this case I've already diced it up. I'm going to put it in here. I will say that you find that the, the grocery store ginger is going to be very hard. So this is one last piece. It takes me a minute to get through this even with a very sharp knife. This is my third incarnation of the ginger. Candy ginger going into the ginger powder and the ginger sugar. So we're going to mix that up a little bit with our hand. And what we're coming back for is the toasted oats that are in the oven. They should be out in about five minutes or so, maybe a little bit less. In the meantime, we're going to take a whole egg, crack it into a measure. And we want actually a quarter of a cup of heavy cream and a quarter cup milk or a half a cup of half and half. I already have that measured out in there. We're going to whisk up that egg and the cream together. We're going to set that over to the side while we check our oats to see if they are ready yet. And probably about another minute they will be ready. So now that our fresh ginger that I peeled and sliced very thinly, it's gone in about a half a cup of water here. What we're going to do is we're actually going to drain that and do it a second time. Seems like an extra step, but it, it, what we're doing is we're softening the ginger at this point. So I'm going to get a strainer here. I'm going to pour the water out. That sounds like our oven might be ready there. All right, so we emptied the first batch of water with the soft ginger. We're going to let this boil again for another few seconds or so. Then we're going to empty it and do one more time with um, the water, except we're going to be adding some sugar to it at this point. Now, the recipe that you're going to see calls for four pounds of ginger. You really aren't going to need that much. But if you um, can uh, decrease that recipe, so for four ounces of ginger, we want basically one cup of water and one cup of sugar. And that's going to give us our um, syrup that we need. So now I'm going to go ahead and empty this. Alright, that can wait off to the side for a second while I get a cup of water to go in our pot. And we want a cup of sugar. I'm going to go ahead and use ginger sugar again. I could use granulated sugar if I wanted to, but I have all this. It's beautiful. I might as well use it. So we want about a cup of sugar. I know it looks like a lot, but we're candying that ginger, so that's the whole point. Add that. I will whisk that up. I've got this on a rapid boil again. That ginger sugar will dissolve in there, and we're going to go ahead and add that sliced thin ginger that I had earlier. And what's going to happen is we're going to let that simmer now for about, I don't know, maybe a half an hour or so, and then the syrup will be nice and clear, and the ginger will, be ta will taste very sweet. I'm going to come back to my batter now for my scones. I'm going to go ahead and add my toasted oats. You may even want to let them cool off a little bit more, but that's okay. We're going to get them mixed in there soon enough. I'm going to reuse my parchment paper, which you'll see in a few moments. I'm going to come in here and I'm mixing up all that I've put into it. And then I'm going to come back with that egg and cream mixture. Now I've turned the ginger off, the fresh ginger, the candied ginger, because now I just want it to sit for a while. After it sits for a while and cools off, you can pour the syrup with the fresh ginger into a jar and you'll have that for whatever you want to use it for. All right, so we're going to come back now with that egg and the cream. I am going to reserve just about a tablespoon, and you'll see why in a few moments. These are great also if you use a silicone baking mat. I think it's known as a sill pad, if I'm not mistaken. So we're going to push our batter onto the parchment paper. You kind of want to put this in a, in a circle. You know, it can be rustic. Don't worry about measuring or anything like that. Push it down. 
You want it to be about an inch thick, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. Now I'm going to cut it into wedges. Um, in this case, I'm going to say let's do six portions. So we'll cut each half into thirds. We're going to separate these a little bit. I'm going to come back with that extra tablespoon of cream and milk that I put together with the egg and I'm going to baste the tops of the scones. So now I've got ginger sugar again. And we're going to sprinkle it over the top. And in this case you can also come back with turbinado again as I mentioned earlier or a raw sugar. Does not have to be a ginger sugar. All right, these are going to go into the oven for about um, 20 minutes or so, maybe 30, depending on your oven. They have come out of the oven. I wanted you to see what I've done is I've taken them off the pan. They're actually beautiful. Maybe could have done a little bit more browning on the top, but what I like to check is how brown they are on the bottom. Um, again, that's going to depend on your oven and, and maybe you have hot spots, maybe we do. But anyway, I've taken them off and I'm letting them cool off just a little bit further and I'm going to let that happen while I make our glaze. We have got a half a cup of confectioner sugar here. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back with yet more ginger and we're going to use the ginger syrup from where I candied the ginger on the uh, burner a little while ago. So I'm going to come back and I'm going to add two tablespoons. I'm going to whisk that up. This is kind of important to measure, to be quite honest, because sometimes if you just sort go to pour, you could add too much and it would be too thin. Um, so you really want to make sure that you get a nice balance of confectioner sugar and ginger syrup. You want a nice drippable consistency here. And we're going to come back and we're just going to go back and forth. So it's a lot of ginger going on. Absolutely my favorite scone to make. Um, and there you have it, Cinco Ginger Scones. I'm Tammy Brawley with The Green Kitchen. Join us next time on Heart of the Home. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at vafb.com slash recipes, as well as on Chef Tammy Brawley's website at greenkitchenrichmond.com. The nation's largest ginger crop is grown in Hawaii, where the tropical climate is ideal for the plant. Ginger rhizomes cannot survive temperatures below 50 degrees, so it has a short growing season in Virginia. Fortunately for ginger fans, hoop houses and greenhouses have made it possible to raise this root crop almost year-round. It's raised for sale on 23 farms in the Old Dominion in addition to many backyard gardens. Ginger is a popular spice in many Asian, Caribbean, and West African foods. It's also a popular ingredient in specialty foods, including beer. Some folks like their food hot, and fresh Virginia peppers deliver just the spice for that. Barry Ridgway reports how some Virginia farmers happily supply their habaneros. It's early spring in Virginia, and this field in Halifax County, dedicated to serrano and jalapeno peppers, is almost ready for the growing season. Plastic helps maintain moisture levels in the soil and deter weed growth. Rows with black plastic will be planted earlier in the season to help keep the plants warm in cool temperatures. The rows with white plastic are planted later to help the pepper plants stay cool. All these beds have been fumigated under. So we'll come in with a water wheel planter on our schedule and it'll poke a hole. It's got a little wheel that turns on the plastic, will poke a hole in it. We plant two rows on each bed, it'll be 16 inches apart. So twin 16 inch row. The Reese family has been growing and selling fresh produce like tomatoes, squash, cucumbers, sweet corn and watermelon in Halifax County for about 30 years. This year about 25 of their 350 acres will be hot peppers. They sell produce in their family store and also to commercial buyers. And really what we grow depends a lot on what they want. If, if they ask us to grow some jalapenos or serranos or things like that and, and that's the reason we grow them is because they've suggested to us to grow them because they think they can sell them. Per bushel I would say it is as profitable as anything but the volume that we move is not as significant as something like corn where we move you know loads and loads of corn truckloads. We don't do that with hot peppers so it's just not as high a volume but there are niche markets on stuff like that and, and it's, it's valuable but just in in that significant niche. While jalapeno, serrano and tabasco are some of the more well-known and beloved hot peppers in the state, Virginia Tech's professor Sean O'Keefe 
explains that they aren't the hottest peppers out there. The really hot ones are somewhat hard to find. It's very difficult to actually find them in the grocery store because very few people are, are, are interested in that type of really hot pepper like the ghost peppers or, and that's around about 1 million Scoville heat units or uh, scorpion peppers, maybe 1.2 million or Carolina reapers, which may be over 2 million in the Scoville heat unit scale. And the Scoville heat unit scale, SHU, is the maximum dilution that you can have and still taste uh, a bit of heat. So if a Scoville heat unit score is 1 million, that means it can be diluted by one over one million and you still notice it is spicy. For reference, habanero peppers range from 100,000 to 350,000 SHU. Tabasco and cayenne peppers range from about 25,000 to 50,000 SHU, while serrano peppers range from 10,000 to 25,000 SHU. I'll buy habaneros and serrano peppers from time to time, but usually for the really hot peppers like the ghost peppers and reapers and scorpions, I'll grow them myself and that way I get them fresh. As part of their research, Virginia Tech food and science technology students study food and flavor chemistry. When working with hot peppers, they use the Scoville heat unit scale to determine the amount of the heat producing ingredient capsaicin. Professor O'Keefe prefers a more simple approach. When I do research on my own, I tend to just use a scale, hot enough, not hot enough. And if it's hot enough, I get the hiccups, and I get the hiccups on the first time I taste it. If it's not hot enough, I won't get the hiccups. With all that heat, some backyard gardeners might shy away from planting hot peppers. While it is safe to grow and handle hot peppers, it's smart to follow a few precautions. Not dangerous by any means, but those peppers are hot. You, know, you can't. You know, if you go out there and handle those peppers, you're going to wash your hands when you're done, I think. It, it's, it's going to be hot. If you touch your eyes after picking those, you're going to know it. The maximum heat level would be around 2, 2.2, 2.4 million on the Scoville heat unit scale. At that level, they definitely have a very strong effect on humans. So you can start finding that you, uh, you start breathing funny, you turn red, you'll get the hiccups if it's hot enough. Uh, and it can have negative effects. Uh, Lethal effects, no. I've not heard of any cases where somebody has died because of eating uh, hot sauce uh, that's too hot. So whether you're buying your hot peppers from growers like the Reese family or you grow them in your backyard, rest assured that beyond the hot flavor, itchy eyes, and maybe some skin irritation, even the hottest of peppers are safe. In Halifax County, Virginia, this is Barry Ridgeway reporting. We're so glad you could join us this week to celebrate all the bounty Virginia has to offer. From the kitchen, to your home and garden, to our beautiful wide open spaces, we are proud to say that this is Real Virginia. For everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a great week. Chesapeake Bay